Welcome to Lessons with Dr. Ted. This is the third video on plot that I've done as part of a series where I explore and explain Aristotle's elements of drama. Lessons with Dr. Ted plot structure classical saw me analyze Romeo and Juliet according to the five-act structure, also known as Freytag's Pyramid of Dramatic Structure. And Lessons with Dr. Ted plot structure modern saw the analyzation of the film Titanic according to the same model. The other two videos go into the definitions and labels in some detail. The five-act structure is often associated with classical plays such as Shakespeare, most of which fit the structure quite nicely, as do most of his contemporaries. The plays of uh, Italy and France fit the structure. Plays during the Restoration were written in five acts. In terms of storytelling, all the main points are covered. Nowadays, you often hear about the three-act structure. Uh, we associate that in film, at least, with a man named Sid Field, who uh, really came out well, considering he didn't write very much. Three episodes of a docuseries in the mid-60s. However, uh, his model has become something of an industry standard, at least in film. If you put the two models on top of each other, you can see how similar they really are. Some of the words may be used a little differently, but they essentially mean the same thing. You might also have heard of the hero's journey. The name associated with this is Joseph Campbell. There's the monomyth, which takes uh, Joseph Campbell's interminable academic tomes and boils them down to about three or four pages. Writers, publishers, producers, and studios have been obsessed at length for decades with the monomyth and the hero's journeys. Hero's journey charts and diagrams are very plentiful online and on YouTube. Look, my background is theater, so I'm snobbish enough to prefer Freytag. Lucas very openly modeled Star Wars, Episode 4, on the hero's journey than the whole original trilogy. Take a snapshot of this screen and watch the movies a bunch of times. Some editions uh, of this model, some copies of this model have fewer or more points. It really doesn't matter as long as the main idea is there. One fun thing to do is with students, I like to do with students, is to retell Star Wars but start getting it wrong and throwing in terms and characters from Harry Potter. Um, Luke Skywalker lived with his uncle and his aunt and he was summoned to Hogwarts, you know, that sort of thing. He got a magic lightsaber. Uh, true story. I tried this in a young man from my son's school during carpool one day. He was furious. He started yelling at me. The stories were completely different. He insisted Luke and Harry had different hair color, if nothing else. Now, I could write an essay exploring how hair color can, can affect our understanding of character and that would be character individuation and not plot. The young man's mother called me that night to ask me why he was up so upset. Long story short, he's at Harvard. Go figure. Wait, there's more. Yes, Buckwheat, there's more. Foreshadowing. Of course, by the time the movie came out, everyone knew he would end up Darth Vader. I'd have paid real money, well, maybe not Lucas's idea of real money, but mine, if Anakin had rejected the Darth side in Sith and let the Jedi cancel whack Palpatine. Now that would have been a twist worthy of Shemelin. Fine, Anakin finally became cool for ten minutes. I guess there is balance in the Force after all. Anakin spends three movies being pointless and ten minutes being cool. And Vader spends three movies being cool and ten minutes being a wuss. Chekhov's gun. This is part of foreshadowing. It, this is also often misunderstood. Anton Chekhov. No relation to Pavel. Chekhov once said... If in the first act you have hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following one it should be fired. Otherwise, don't put it there. Well, actually, he said something a little more along the lines of, 
Uh, jestli vi pivervom akte povesili na stenu pistolet, to v poslednim on dolžen vistrelit. Inače, ne vešajte jevo. Well, my accent's a little off. But Chekhov meant was, don't make false promises. You can certainly have a gun hanging on a wall to, I don't know, add color or establish the character as a sportsman. But if the author or director calls attention, special attention to the gun, then it should probably be used or intentionally and ob obviously not used. I spent a novel where I spent an entire book waiting for some payoff for a three-page dissertation on a character's relationship with horses and her love of riding. These three pages, it turned out, were just color. Yes, I'm talking about you, Clive Cussler. Jacques. I even think it's one of these two books. But let's face it, all of his books are the same. The MacGuffin changes name, that's all. Even when he hands over the series to Dirk Pitt's son, the characters are the same, flat and completely static. <sighs> Obstacles. Straight lines are boring, at least in narration. Getting around the boulder is more interesting than just driving along the road. If their families weren't feuding, Romeo and Juliet would be the story of two kids who met and hooked up. They have to go through tunnels and over mountains and fight elves and goblins and a dragon. Otherwise, they would just walk to the mountain and take the gold, or someone else would have done so without a dragon there. Authors give us obstacles. Conflict. Okay, this might be related somewhat to obstacles. It's pretty important. Remember, so much of this whole Aristotle stuff, models, archetypes, and all that, has to do with keeping an audience's attention. The stakes don't have to be terribly high, but few people would spend a lot of time watching a movie or reading a book if everyone got along all the time and agreed with each other on everything. There are traditionally six types of conflict. Man versus self. Sorry, spoilers. If you haven't seen Five Club, you probably do know the ending by now. Man versus man. Man versus society. Man versus nature. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy all for the love of you. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't afford a carriage. But you'll look sweet upon a sea. Of a bicycle bill. Four, two. Man versus the gods, or fate, or the supernatural, what have you. Flashbacks. Flashbacks are often employed. They are extended interruptions of the narrative. Um, sometimes they can drive the story. Often they are used to give characters depth or backstory. Up takes place here, but much of it happens here. Forrest Gump takes place here. Much of it takes place there. I suppose you could argue that uh, Forrest Gump is a frame story because the flashbacks make up most of the, mer the narrative, much like <laughs> Titanic. Playing fair. Properly, this applies to detective novels, uh, specifically to whodunits. Hercule Poirot is a great example of playing fair. He says, We shall all repair to the parlor where I shall tell you who it was killed the victim. There, he explains, on the page 15, Page 15, I was sure that it was the maid, but on page 127, I realized that she wore le 
Wasox. On page 235, I realized that Monsieur Baldouin ate shrimp, which led me to using my cells to determine that their chauffeur killed the minister in the library with a candlestick. Not to be confused with Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes stories are not whodunits, they are how he figures it out. Playing fair, a man named Father Knox, a writer in the early 20th century, came up with the Ten Commandments for detective fiction. Playing fair, of course, usually applies to detective fiction. However, by extension, playing fair is when an author is, has given you all the information you need to understand the story. There are a lot of books out there that you might appreciate a great deal if you went out and did years of study on the subject of the period. Still, the authors have supposedly done their work. You can follow the story and the character's motivations without any real extra work. True, some people will bring up books like Finnegan's Wake. Really? Most of you can't name five people who've ever read that book. If you can, most of them probably lied. Let's face it, call it avant-garde or dreamlight or what have you. Even people who have slogged through it could probably not tell you what it's about. There's a reason for that. It's not very good. Just most cognoscente are too embarrassed to say so. Peripatia. It's a turning point. It's a reversal of circumstances for the hero. This is arguably one of the most famous moments of peripety in film when Vader tells Luke that he's Luke's father. And if I've just ruined Empire for you, I'm sorry. Anagnerosis. It's a discovery, a realization, um, a critical discovery or realization. A famous example from Romeo and Juliet. Deus ex machina. It means God from the machine. If an author writes himself into a corner, it's not unheard of, or at least back in the day, for him to have a god pop down from the heavens and resolve everything somehow. Like that. Medea is the classic example. A chariot flies down and carries Medea off. Here's a modern example. The idea that a real contrivance resolves everything, or pushes the plot forward, or drives the characters into doing things that the characters wouldn't do otherwise. Something external to their story. Titanic is actually a good example of that as well. If the story is a love story between Jack and Rose, then the, the iceberg is a deus ex machina of sorts. Of course, the big question is how important these models are, and all how important all this information is. For academics, it's very important. Many of us study how these stories are told. Students need to learn this stuff. This is far more important than themes or imagery or all those funny terms. Unfortunately, many, if not most, English teachers and professors don't get this. They dwell on symbolism with students who don't understand the structure. This is to some degree because that's how the teachers were taught. For what it's worth, if you read a lot or watch a lot of TV or movies, you know this stuff, really. You just might never have thought about it. Once you've seen a movie 20 times, you start to get the patterns. For the industry, well, absolutely. These people are money people. They're not inherently interested in making art or breaking boundaries. The formula works and makes money, so why not stick to it? Of course, sometimes the formula goes too far. In TV, the structure is determined by how much, or how little, to be honest, show they put in between the commercials. For artists, well, any successful screenwriter understands the formula because the industry demands it. Shakespeare clearly understood structure and formula. His plays almost all fit perfectly. Tolkien was intentionally modeling his work on existing myths. Martin is intentionally trying to subvert tropes. They both understand the craft. They are both good writers, too. That, by the way, is incidental. There are more successful writers out there who understand the craft but can't put words together well than there are artists who write beautifully but who cannot tell a story. Of course, the best are talented 
and skilled. So I'll be back soon with videos on character, thought, diction, music, and spectacle, and more haiku reviews and other things. I'm sorry the source list is so tiny. There are quite a few. I'm working out all the technicalities. Thank you.